Hi, welcome to a new series, which I'm calling Gaming in Go. In this series, we're going to be writing an original video game using Go as our language of choice. We're going to be taking a look at some beginner and intermediate game development concepts and implementing them on camera. You could call this a let's code or something, and I encourage you to follow along. But before we get started, let's talk motivation. Why would you want to write a game in Go? Well, because writing a Go is fun, right? In all seriousness though, we're going to be doing some language experimentation to find out if Go is a good language for basic game development. Game programming is a problem domain that demands a lot from the language it's written in, so being a good game programming language is no small feat. Before we jump in and try for ourselves though, I've identified three criteria that any good game programming language should deliver on. Speed, library support, and appropriate language design. Let's use this to create a feasibility study of sorts for Go. To better understand how Go stacks up in each of these categories, let's compare it to C++, a proven language in the space. Many games and game engines have been written in C++, and it's the tool of choice for the industry. For speed, C++ is often considered the gold standard, and in microbenchmark, C++ tends to perform very well. It's tough to make generalizations about performance, but I would say that C++ is a faster language than Go. But don't get me wrong, Go is no slouch. It tends to perform reasonably close to C++ in these benchmarks, with a few definite exceptions, and Go benchmarks substantially better than languages like Python or Node.js, which are often seen as slow languages. But benchmarks aren't everything, and could be a poor indicator of actual performance. We'll see if speed becomes a problem in our game. Go is also a garbage collected language, meaning that it frees memory that we're no longer using for us. Conventional wisdom suggests that since garbage collected languages are subject to potentially long pauses for execution while the garbage collector does its job, it would be impossible to guarantee a consistent frame rate. Go is a bit of a special case here though. Its garbage collector is concurrent, meaning that it runs alongside the program instead of stopping it, freeing memory, and starting it again. The garbage collector still has pauses, but they're very short, often less than one millisecond, which should be imperceptible to the user unless it happens really frequently. C and C++ are the kings when it comes to library support for high-performance graphics. OpenGL is the most common library choice for cross-platform 3D rendering, and it only has direct support for C and C++. Other languages that want to use accelerated graphics are generally relegated to using bindings. However, this is an aspect where Go excels. CGo, if you're not familiar, is Go's excellent tool for writing C bindings, so we can leverage the C and C++ library ecosystem rather easily. We won't have to write any C Go code though, because bindings for the libraries we need already exist and we're going to be using them. So at least in theory, it doesn't seem like this will be a problem. The last point I want to talk about is that of language design. It's common for game developers to reach for an object-oriented design when writing a game, and that's a reasonable strategy. Entities in video games do seem to have a natural class of sorts. Taking a look at this scene from a popular game that will remain unnamed, it's easy to pick out potential classes. This guy right here might be represented as an object of the class player. This little scamp might be of the class Goomba. And this might be a Koopa Troopa. There are lots of easy cases for inheritance here too. Maybe the Goomba and Koopa Troopa classes inherit from a shared enemy class, which might contain whatever shared code they have. Video games also have a lot of interdependent state held in each entity. So a class's ability to hold multiple pieces of data and communicate using methods would seem to make them a great choice. We certainly could write a game like this in Go. Structs, which are Go's closest analog to classes, are at least as good a composite type as classes are, and they can have methods associated with them, much like classes do. Go does not have support for inheritance in the same way C++ or Java do, however. Even so, I think you would see a lot of success writing a game in Go this way, but it's worth noting that there are other ways to write game code. Unity, a 3D and 2D game engine, uses a component architecture instead of an object-oriented one. Components in Unity are classes that are split up based on functionality, not by their kind. Taking a look at the same example in a component architecture, every entity here might just be of the class Entity. What differentiates them are the components that are attached to them. The player entity might have a platforming controller attached to it, giving the player the ability to move around and jump. The Goomba entity might have a move forward component to make it move, and a squashable component to control how it's defeated. I think this strategy is fascinating, and we're going to try to implement this in Go in a future video, where we'll also go into more detail on Unity's component architecture. So, okay, enough meta talk. In the next episode, I'll be introducing SDL2, a C library with some great Go bindings that we'll be using to create 2D environments. Then we'll start work on our game. But until then, I'm Tyler Compton, and this was Gaming in Go. Thanks for watching.